Foundation. Uh, you're going to have to indulge me for about 10 minutes as I shamelessly pitch our organization and the Linux platform. It's just the price of having me as a keynote speaker, unfortunately. Uh, I want to talk then about open source and uh, in government. Some of the global trends that we're observing at the foundation, uh, some of the different things that I'm seeing in terms of use within government uh, to, of open source, um, and then uh, use of open source as a matter of policy in government, and I'll explain that as I go through uh, my presentation. And then finally, I want to talk about open source and open standards. Uh, often these two phrases are used interchangeably. What I'd like to do this morning is highlight the differences between the two um, and use Linux as an example of why both are really critical as you invest in open platforms, uh, in the systems that you use, or in the policy that you create as government. So where is Linux today? How many people here use Linux, know Linux? Everybody. Excellent. That's, that's great. I often talk to crowds where you know, I get a small group of people who don't know Linux, and the easiest way to explain what Linux is to them is just to walk them through how they use Linux every day in their lives. When you log on to Google, you're actually uh, using Linux. Uh, Google runs on the Linux platform. Uh, when you place a cell phone call on your Motorola Razr phone or one of the myriad of smartphones that many folks in Asia use, uh, you're using Linux. When you log on to your online banking system, you're using Linux. If when you record a television show on TiVo, uh, you're using Linux. Um, Linux is really being used in an increasing and just a massive growth we're seeing in, in ways that Linux is being used every day. Um, we're, we're seeing really innovative ways that Linux is being used. Uh, for example, in the One Laptop Per Child initiative, which is really bringing computing to people in poverty who hadn't had access to that before. One of the interesting things about the One Laptop Per Child uh, movement is it's not only benefiting people in the developing world to have access to technology, but it's really uh, influencing the whole manufacturing process of PCs. Uh, I was in Taipei about a month ago and saw some new devices that are coming out which are very lightweight, low power uh, internet devices which uh, really benefited from all of the work that the One Laptop Per Child program did in trying to reduce the cost of computing. So not only is it benefiting uh, those folks in, in poverty, but it's really creating a new class of devices. So really what we're seeing in Linux today is it's, it's just really everywhere. And the market data is really backing this up. Server sales are growing faster in the Linux marketplace uh, relative to any of their competitors. Billions of dollars worth of systems are being used annually uh, based on Linux. In supercomputing, we're seeing Linux dominate the combination of uh, off-the-shelf uh, hardware with the Linux platform running in parallel systems are really creating a new class of supercomputers that produce price performance that's really second to none. In the embedded space, we're really seeing a massive growth as embedded device manufacturers see the Linux platform as a way to get better products to market faster. In an oftentimes, uh, you know, six to 12 month concept to carrier competitive world of mobile devices, Linux is really something that these organizations and companies can use to get a head start on bringing a product to market. And we're seeing a massive increase in use there. And on the desktop, we're finally starting to see Linux emerge as a credible competitor to existing desktop platforms out there. PC manufacturers such as Dell, Lenovo, and HP are now shipping Linux pre-installed on their laptop and desktop PCs. Uh, we're seeing a huge increase in market share globally as more and more uh, regions around the world adopt the Linux desktop. Um, we're, we're really, we need a lot of work to be done on the desktop front, but we're really starting to see the beginnings of growth there. And that's all good. So how did we get to this point? How did Linux grow from this idea that Linus Torvalds had, a mailing list, to this ubiquitous computing environment? Well, the important thing to understand about Linux is just the massive scope and speed at which the whole platform develops. And that's really based on the development methodology, which is open source. Um, this is really one of the largest and most unparalleled development efforts in the history of computing. There are thousands of core contributors to the Linux kernel. 
uh, producing thousands of lines of code every single day, changing thousands of lines of code every single day. In the past several years, the Linux kernel has gone from 2 million lines of code to 7 million lines of code as more and more devices and platforms are covered in this massive collaborative development effort. As this development effort happens, the speed at which Linux is being developed is really impressive. If you think of the Linux kernel releasing every two and a half to three months, a Linux desktop such as the Ubuntu platform releasing every six month, enterprise desktops uh, releasing every, uh, and, and servers releasing every 12 months to 18 months, it's just an impressive speed at which the Linux platform is iterating and increasing in its function uh, and in its innovation. Um, in contrast, if you look at proprietary platforms, uh, it's taken them years and years. Uh, in the example of Microsoft, seven years to get Vista to the marketplace. Um, this shared and rapid development model also has real cost benefit to the companies that are offering commercial products based on the Linux platform. Uh, Red Hat is a great example of a publicly traded company with a $4 billion market cap uh, that saves literally hundreds of millions of dollars on R&D every year by sharing that development with the rest of the Linux community. So really speed, agility, all of these things are what has created this powerful advantage for Linux as a platform. We've never really seen before in platform computing so many developers from so many places working around one piece of software uh, and developing it so quickly. And so as we look at this ubiquitous use of Linux throughout the server, the mobile and embedded space, as we see that grow, at the foundation what we're thinking about is the next stage of Linux growth. Really, if you look at the multi-billion dollar marketplace and this broad use, it's pretty clear that not a lot of people need to be convinced that Linux is a good platform to use and, and, and really provides meaningful cost benefit. Um, that was something that we really went through a few years ago, but we're sort of beyond that stage now. What we're really entering now is the second stage of growth for open source and Linux, and that's a mainstream uh, stage where Linux is really competing head to head with the other dominant platform out there, which is frankly, Microsoft Windows. And we really see a future of computing where you have two development models competing, competing for developer mind share, competing for market share, competing on innovation. And those two ideas are really about open and closed and really characterized by Linux and Microsoft. And so at the Linux Foundation, when we think about this new stage, we really look at our competitor, Microsoft Windows, and say, what are some of the things that have made them so successful? And as we enter into this second stage of mainstream competition, what are things that we can do, respecting them as a competitor, uh, to improve the Linux platform? And I think it's safe to say that Microsoft has been unambiguously one of the most successful software companies in the history of computing. Um, they've done things very well to get to that position, albeit those, that, that position they're at right now precludes many people from choice in their platforms. Some of the things that they do very well is they promote their platform effectively. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars promoting the uh, Microsoft platform. Uh, they uh, are very aggressive competitors. Uh, I think may, you may have seen in the news even as uh, early as last week, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt created by uh, Microsoft and uh, about uh, legal concerns around open source and Linux. Um, they do that because they make $12 billion a year off of their platform and they see a competitive threat in open source and Linux and anything they can do to create doubt in the marketplace is something that's obviously to their competitive advantage. So we need to respect the fact that we're going to see that as a competitive platform on Linux and, and we need to address that in particular. And then finally, Microsoft does have something that uh, is very valuable to many, a ubiquitous platform standard that's indicated by that tiny Design for Windows logo on all of your laptops and on software all around the world. Uh, and that's an easy thing for people to understand in terms of knowing that this piece of software will work with, this piece of hardware will work with the Windows platform. Uh, and of course, all of these things come at the cost of choice. So, what does the Linux Foundation need to do and, and sort of what we're doing at the foundation is addressing this second stage by looking at our competitor, 
looking at this new stage we're entering into and trying to work with the Linux community, industry, and all of the users of Linux to make the Linux platform more competitive. The things that we're focused on are promoting Linux. Just like Linux is used or is developed in a collaborative model, we're also looking at collaboratively promoting the Linux platform by working with our members to act as a neutral spokesperson for the platform um, and so that we're not just pitching somebody's wares, we're really pitching the concept of an open platform and getting people excited about that into this uh, open source uh, world. Uh, we're looking at promoting Linux by hosting events where we bring together the greatest minds of open source, the key developers who work on the kernel or all of the hundreds of projects that make up the platform, and getting them in front of key users of the technology and key uh, members of uh, our, our companies who make decisions about how to use Linux in the marketplace from a technical offering. Um, those events happen twice a year, and they, what they really do is allow that sort of speed of development to get even faster by bringing people together into a room and making technical decisions and again leveraging that uh, number one strength of open source which is the speed of development. We uh, are focused on protecting Linux just as our competitors attack the platform as a good, protect, uh, a good competitor. Uh, we're looking at protecting the platform by providing fellowships for people like Linus Torvalds who lives and works here in Portland, Oregon providing him with a neutral place to work so that he's unfettered by the quarterly uh, needs of the business world and can really work in a place where there's an even playing field for the development of the platform. We're working on getting information about legal uncertainty out into the marketplace so that people understand that there's no greater risk in adopting open source software from a legal perspective than adopting proprietary software from a, a legal perspective. And I can assure you when it comes to both licensing or IP issues, uh, both proprietary software and open source software do contain inherent risk. Uh, and I believe that uh, as good lawyers, it's often uh, the job of an attorney to point out risk, uh, but I'd say there's equal amount of risk and there's also uh, a, a reward that you need to uh, consider in the uh, equation here. And there's obvious great reward in using open source that mitigates that uh, any risk that might be there. Finally, one of the things we're working on at the foundation is helping to standardize the platform. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in my presentation today about what that means, how you work with the open source community to define open standards so that things work together, just as in that Microsoft world where you understand that a Windows logo uh, branded product will work with any Windows logo branded hardware or software. Uh, we need that type of interoperable ecosystem in open source. And often it's, it's tricky when this sort of collaborative development model is being spread out among so many organizations to define the standards at a pace that keeps up with that rapid development model in a way that enables this interoperability. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about how we're doing that. So this just gives you a flavor of all the things that the foundation is doing to help promote, protect, and standardize the platform uh, because we really believe that in the future, the world is going to evolve into two platforms, the Windows world and the Linux and open source world, and we really want to make the Linux platform competitive in that second stage. How are we doing that? Well, we're having our members help us, uh, and the members of the Linux Foundation uh, represent a combined market cap uh, that exceeds any individual company by a long shot. It is an impressive array of companies that are coming together because they have a strategic interest in the future of the Linux platform, whether it's from the, their use of Linux or whether it's from their use of Linux uh, to, to sell a new product. It's really an impressive array uh, that can give anyone assurance that this platform is here to stay for quite some time. So that gives you a little bit of flavor of where Linux at, is at the, in the marketplace and what the uh, Linux Foundation is working on. What I'd like to spend a little bit time, uh, of time now talking about is what we're seeing in terms of trends of Linux and open source usage in the government around the world. So I want to look at a few different points about why government uh, is considering open source, why governments around the world are concerned about open source. I'd like to show you a few examples of where government uh, is using open source, uh, either as a matter of use or public policy. Um, 
I'd like to spend a few minutes then talking about why open source alone is not the answer um, and give you some advice uh, as users of technology or policymakers about why you need to think of not only open source but open standards. And then I'll conclude on why the two can really produce positive benefits to your economy uh, or to your usage of open source in your organization. So how does government look at open source? Well, there are really two ways, uh, two major ways that we see government looking at open source. I think in the United States, most people look at open source from this first perspective as users uh, of technology. Uh, obviously, the U.S. federal government, state and local government are massive users of technology and really influence the IT marketplace with their purchasing clout uh, through the decisions that they make. Uh, they also have a fiduciary duty to the taxpayers to spend their money effectively, so they're under even more scrutiny in terms of the technical decisions that they make, in terms of total cost of ownership, ongoing maintenance and support. And so when government in the U.S. is looking at uh, or tends to look at open source from this first perspective as a consumer uh, of technology, most governments see it as a way of maximizing the efficiency uh, of the products that they use in their IT systems through creating better competition, through creating shared collaboration through this open source development model. And as a consumer of technology, what we're seeing from government is that they, it, it is slightly different than the private sector in terms of some of the requirements that they have and some of the characteristics of usage. And what I mean by that is in the private sector when we see uh, the use of open source, a lot of the reasons that we see are around cost, around agility, around faster time to market. These are the things that they really consider. And different from private industry, government also has another requirement, which is it's often in government's interest to share technology across different departments, different municipalities, and so forth. That incentive is actually higher than in private industry where you know, competitors in the financial services industry don't necessarily need to share IT uh, development across their organizations, and some, sometimes it's helpful to them, but I would say that government has an even higher incentive to share and development across the different agencies. And so in this case, open source is very very well suited for government because it allows for this transparent collaborative development uh, and really enables uh, IT organizations to sort of raise the, the, the tide for all ships in the government. Um, and I'll show you some examples of where we're seeing that type of usage of open source in government today. The second area uh, that governments are telling us they're, they're talking about when they think of open source is really as a, ma as a matter of economic and strategic policy. And this we're seeing more overseas. You know, the U.S. I think is, is more in the category of the first. Uh, I think the entire world really fits into the category uh, in terms of government use of open source as good consumers of technology. They want to consider the benefits of, of lower cost and better performance. But it's really overseas where we're seeing uh, open source as a matter of economic and strategic policy. When I go and travel to countries, uh, often I meet with folks who are in uh, IT ministries uh, who see open source as a way to address a market failure in, that, that they're seeing in their countries. Um, one of the things that's a conflict in, in these countries around information technology is the desire to take advantage of the network effect of technology, right? The fact that more users, that the more users there are of a particular technology, the more benefit you get, right? The, number of people who incrementally use the internet, the higher the value of that goes. And certainly in platform software, uh, and, and certainly in the case of Windows, the number of people using the Windows platform produces uh, a benefit, right? The more people, the, the more applications are available on that uh, platform, the easier it is to exchange information on that platform. Um, which is a good thing, but that's actually uh, in conflict with uh, another government concern, which is to prevent monopolies, right, and to foster competition. So governments are struggling with this dichotomy of how do I prevent monopolies but take advantage of these network effects in the market. So uh, I think we're seeing in a lot of countries a struggle with how to balance this, and they're really looking to open source as a way to help solve that balance in the marketplace. Um, 
A lot of governments that I talk to around the world see open source as something that's strategic in terms of reducing their dependency on single source technology. Um, Microsoft, again, is the global uh, dominant platform vendor out there, uh, and you're seeing cases where, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Japan, of uh, public policy makers saying, wait, we don't want to be completely locked into a single foreign vendor. What we'd really like to do is promote a domestic solution uh, that, that can compete with uh, these companies and these technologies, uh, and they find open source as a way that they can do that, and I'll give you a few examples of that in a second. Um, Again, governments are looking at developing a domestic software industry. China is perhaps one of the best examples of this, where they're really struggling with um, what has been sort of a laggard start in uh, the IT economy. Uh, in other words, the domestic software industry in China is nowhere near what the domestic software industry he is here in North America. They look to open source as a way sort of kickstart uh, an internal economy where they produce the next uh, you know, SAP, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, and they see this sort of shared good of open source, uh, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of man years of effort that's gone into developing this technology as a way to sort of get a head start rather than having to start completely from scratch, uh, which would make it incredibly difficult for them to compete with this North American dominance in software. Uh, finally, governments are concerned about uh, intellectual property and patents um, as they set standards to create IC information communication technology uh, ecosystems. They're concerned about setting standards that would require some sort of patent royalty to be paid out to anyone who implements those uh, IT solutions in their marketplace. Uh, and they see open source as a way to guide them to solutions and standards uh, that are often uh, royalty free or non-patent bearing, uh, again, as a matter of public policy to reduce their dependence on the owners of, uh, of patents, which tend to be uh, in North America and uh, in Europe. So these are just a flavor of some of the things that we're seeing out there in terms of the way government is looking at open source. Uh, and again, it really falls into these two categories, either as a consumer or as a matter of policy. On the consumer side, we're really seeing some exciting things happening and some real breakthroughs in terms of innovative uses in government to reduce cost. Uh, in Spain, we're seeing uh, laptops being rolled out uh, that have saved them millions of dollars uh, by utilizing open source over proprietary technology. Uh, in the United States, NASA, as a user of technology, is uh, combining commercial off-the-shelf sh infrastructure hardware with Linux to create uh, supercomputing uh, price performance that's really unparalleled. Uh, in the UK, the government recently, in fact, last week, an MP uh, uh, just announced that they believe that they can generate real savings in terms of software costs and infrastructure by implementing open source. Uh, in Russia, just uh, la this month, uh, they're rolling out a program to provide Linux to all of the schools in Russia in order to save costs. This is a multi-year, uh, multi-tens of millions of dollar commitment from Russia in order to improve uh, the uh, IT uh, platforms that are used in schools there in Russia. Uh, there are literally hundreds of these examples. I just wanted to highlight a few of them for you, uh, but there are hundreds of examples of where government as a consumer of technology is using open source, not as a matter of public policy, just as a matter of good IT purchase making. Where we're seeing government use open source in a strategic manner is in areas like Japan, uh, where the Japanese government recently announced that uh, they would like to decrease their reliance on Microsoft as a server operating system platform. They're switching over some, many of their payroll systems to uh, open source and they expect that to not only provide a uh, cost benefit, but they also see it as a strategic benefit in terms of not being dependent on any single platform. Uh, in the UK, uh, the, uh, an MP announced again last week they really see the need to decrease the hold of monopolies on the government systems that they use. And um, you can see them starting to really struggle with this idea of balancing positive network effects that Windows has created with the need for competition. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, they really were seeing dozens of 
countries and policymakers there seeing open source as a way to, in their words, close the digital gap. In other words, provide computing to people in poverty in a cost-effective way um, and to promote their local economies. So that gives you an example of what we're seeing in the world today and what really government should be thinking about when they consider open source, both from a strategic perspective and a policy perspective and from using open source in general. So let's talk a little bit about open source and open standards, because in government, these are the two words that I hear the most, and, I, and this is, these are the two things that I hear the most confusion about in terms of what's the difference between the two and how they can work in a complementary fashion. So often what you hear in the media or in people who are beginning to look at open source is this concept that open source frees you from vendor lock-in, right? It's the thing that allows you to choose any platform, implement that, you've got the code, you can do anything you want with it, um, and that really gives you the freedom and the competition in the marketplace that you require. Um, and people sort of take this as gospel, that open source alone will give you this freedom uh, that you really want. And this might be a little controversial, particularly coming from the Linux Foundation, but I want all of you to remember one thing today, that open source does produce a lot of positive benefits. Open source does provide a degree of choice, but open source alone will not give you the kind of choice that you really want. And let me talk a little bit about that. The reason that it's not just open source that will give you this choice is because the attributes of open source and open standards are quite different. And I want to just show you the differences so you can think about this when I show you how you can combine the use of open standards in the, de the deployment of Linux with the, the great attributes of open source to really get the benefits of both of these uh, concepts. If you really think about open source, what it is, is it's a development methodology, right? It's a way to produce software. Uh, it's open by design. It's uh, licenses are one of either share and share alike or making that code freely available with the software. It's that collaborative development model. And in open source, generally, uh, the uh, software that's produced is royalty free. In other words, there's not a lot of IP landmines there uh, that you, you, you step on. In contrast, open source is not a development methodology, it's a set of specifications. It's a way to define software so it works together. Uh, HTML is a good example of a standard, right? It's uh, not a set of code, right? It's a set of specifications that allow the internet to work interoperably so that web pages can be developed in a uniform way and can work on different HTML compliant web browsers. Uh, its openness is by definition. Right, that you define these standards so that they are by definition uh, open and interoperable. It enables interoperability, and this is the key difference. Open standards allow information to be exchanged evenly. They allow things to work interoperably. That's what open standards do. In open source, you cannot assume that this is going to happen. And I'm going to show you in Linux why this is important to understand. Um, Licensing, open standards, there are various types of licensing. Um, the collaboration, the, the model of development of standards is uh, similar in terms of collaboration. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about open standards is uh, some standards can be uh, royalty bearing, inclusive of patents. It's important as you as governments look at open, developing open standards and using them to create your information communication technology ecosystems uh, that you consider whether or not a standard you're creating has a royalty bearing aspect to that because that's going to cost the people who are trying to comply with the standard. So as you can see, with open standards, you're really setting a spe set of specifications to define interoperability. With open source, you're really implementing those specifications with code. So the way to really think about this, the way to sort of uh, uh, hammer the point home, is if you use open source and you see that as a matter of choice, what you really have to think about is what would the cost of change be? Right? Because that's the ultimate choice. If I choose an open source project or implementation, that gives me choice to move to a different implementation. But often as a user of technology, the big thing you have to consider is the cost of choice. Because often the cost of choice is something that actually precludes you from moving to a different platform. 
Um, and this is just as true in proprietary software. Moving from Windows to Linux has a, a high cost in many cases that precludes some people from uh, moving to that because moving to Linux because the benefits don't outweigh the cost of moving. The same thing can happen from moving from one open source implementation to another open source implementation. The easiest way to think about this is recently I talked with a Wall Street firm that began a 12-month Linux to Linux migration, right? Because the two versions of the one version of Linux that they were moving to was different than the version that they were currently using. So they had to go recompile all of their applications. They had to create a new support infrastructure for this. So as you can see, there's a cost of changing from Windows to Linux. But in open source, if you don't adhere to standards, there can also be a, a cost of change from moving to Linux to Linux. Sometimes that cost of change can be so high that it actually precludes you from the choice that you had so desired when you chose uh, open source in the first place. An example of this uh, is to ask yourself, what is Linux, right? And this gives you an example of the things you need to think about when implementing open source and how you need to combine this with open standards. When you're using Linux, you're not just using the Linux kernel, you're using hundreds of packages that really make the Linux platform, right? And you can get Linux either from a commercial sense from companies like Red Hat or Novell. You can get it from free and open source projects like Fedora or Debian. Um, and all of these projects tend to use uh, upstream technology or sort of core technology that's, uh, that's created in collaborative projects and, and integrate those into the platform that you end up using as an end user. What's important to understand and why it's important to implement standards in this open source world is that as these projects rapidly iterate, as the different versions of Linux are created, tiny changes can happen, right? One version of Linux uses a different file layout than another version of Linux, right? And as you, those tiny changes take place, one version of Linux uses a different packaging system than another version of Linux. One version of Linux uses a different configuration than another version of Linux. If these changes happen over time, if there's not some guidelines, some standards to create a way to do this in a uniform way, what you really see is new versions of open source Linux created that are incompatible with each other. This is the worst place to be if you're a government user of Linux or of open source. To have chosen an open source platform or to, when talking to a lot of governments around the world, to have created your own implementation of Linux, a national implementation of Linux, and to have essentially forked the code, gone down a path where eventually the Malaysian version of Linux is incompatible with the North American version of Linux, is incompatible with the Chinese version of Linux, and you're sort of stranded on this island of having to support your own version of Linux. All the applications on that platform only work on your version. It's extremely expensive to go and maintain an operating platform on your own, and this idea of getting choice has actually been usurped by the unbelievable burden of having to maintain your own operating system. So this idea of tiny changes over time creating new versions of open source technology, whether it's in Linux, whether it's in web browsers, is something to really keep in mind when you uh, are procuring open source technology. The way to best think of this is these tiny changes are, are like speciation in nature where, you know, genetically over time uh, species become incompatible. And this is a good idea in terms of how to look at this. This actually comes from a, a Microsoft advertisement uh, where they talk about the risk of open source being uh, how you never really know what you're getting and how these things uh, all become different. If Linux fragments, if you choose an open source uh, solution that's not adhering to open standards and not adhering to the mainline world, really you're going to get less value because this network effect that you were looking for, the benefits of being able to interoperate with everyone, is gone. You're, you're sort of down your own silo. Uh, if you needed to change later on and you were using an incompatible version of Linux, you would need to port all of your applications to a different version. There'd be less choice, less competitive pressure, slower innovation. All those great benefits of open source would actually be defeated if they weren't implemented in a standardized way. This is something that I really uh, find surprising 
uh, to, to, to see so many organizations and government agencies not considering when they deploy uh, open source technology. Uh, obviously, this is uh, good for Microsoft uh, because people, when they see that risk, they see that they can interoperate and achieve those network effects, can just simply default to uh, the Microsoft monopoly. Uh, Microsoft has created their standard well by creating a de facto set of standards, uh, a set of interfaces that programmers use to create uh, software for that platform, tests and tools to uh, help developers understand how to utilize their uh, de facto standard, their set of APIs, uh, and they obviously have that branding program that comes at the cost of choice. So how do we solve this? How do we get the best, best of both worlds? And I want to use the Linux case as an example. How do we balance this desire to get the network effects uh, of a single interoperable platform with the need for competition? Well, the idea is combining open source and open standards to really achieve that result. And this is something that's pretty exciting that the Linux Foundation has been working on uh, that I believe is pretty innovative in terms of, from a standard setting effort, creating standards in a way that keep up with this rapid development model. Um, the program that we're using to do this type of work is called the Linux Standard Base. And the Linux Standard Base is really a model for government to consider uh, when looking at open source and open standards. What the LSB does is really provide three things that Microsoft provides, albeit in their proprietary de facto standard. It provides a set of standards, a common set of components that define the Linux platform, file layout, configuration language. It provides for backward compatibility in defining the different components that make up the platform. These standards are developed collaboratively by all of the different Linux distribution vendors, Red Hat, Novell, Debian, Ubuntu, dozens, uh, who provide co either commercial or non-commercial support for the Linux platform. We actually work with uh, the Chinese government who's uh, building their own uh, Linux platform uh, to help decide what goes into the standard. We're providing uh, one of the world's most comprehensive set of testing frameworks to uh, be able to help Linux distribution vendors and application vendors write to the standard and comply with the standard. Uh, we literally have dozens and dozens of engineers uh, throughout the world, whether it's in Moscow, Japan, China, Portugal, you name it, uh, who are writing these tests and providing a framework for uh, compliance with the standard itself. And we're creating a certification and branding, pro branding program very similar to design for uh, Windows. It's uh, a LSB uh, compliant uh, label that will indicate uh, compliance with the standards so that if you utilize an LSB compliant Linux distribution, you know that that uh, distribution will work and be compatible with all of the different applications that are available for the platform. And so this is something that's pretty exciting and you should consider when deploying Linux in government or using Linux as, in a strategic way uh, that really complying with the standard is going to balance those two desires of network effects and choice. Uh, all major uh, Linux distributions are complying. Most major application vendors targeting the Linux platform are using the standard to build applications to it so that if you're deploying SAP on Novell, uh, it should work equally on Red Hat. What this means is through the open standard, you get standard applications that work on a standard platform. You get a decrease of the cost of change by decreasing the components of change. You get all of that high quality resulting from the increased competition of interoperable, interchangeable uh, systems uh, with all of the speed of development from open source. So really, it's the combination of these two that really produce the desired results that government uh, and IT users are looking for. So what should governments consider when using open source and Linux today? What are some of the things that you should be thinking about when you implement open source? Well, look at your solution stack and identify areas where you need collaborative development. Platform software, Linux in particular, is obviously uh, a key area. But there are other uh, areas, I'm sure, in government that are sort of things that are context, things that uh, aren't mission critical to your particular department or agency where you can share in collaboration uh, in developing IT technology. Identify those areas uh, and create open source projects to support that. Um, you should look at controlling the rate of adoption of open source. You know, don't just go and 
implement open source for open source stake, uh, really look at areas where it's strategic to your interest uh, and deploy it in that way. Uh, you should involve legal experts to help you assist in understanding licensing and IP concerns. The Linux Foundation can offer this help to you. There are lots of lawyers out there who can offer this help to you. I think when you enlist the advice of these folks, you'll find that uh, there is really no greater legal risk for open source than there is for proprietary. And when you are implementing open source, and Linux in particular, one of the things that you want to look at is inserting language into your procurement policy that requires open standards-based systems to be implemented rather than just open source. Uh, I've given you the exact wording that you can actually cut and paste into your license and support agreements as a procurer of technology that will help you uh, do this. Um, the other thing is if you're large government organizations writing applications on open source platforms, I encourage you to understand the different standards that are out there for different layers of the open source stack, and I encourage you to write applications to those standards so that you don't go down a technology dead end uh, and so that you end up getting the benefit of this collaborative model. And then finally, a shameless pitch for our organization. Join the Linux Foundation and User Council and help us create feedback to the open source community that will enable them to create even better software for your government or your agency. So I think I've talked for about an hour. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I, I have a few minutes here to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I think I can take about five minutes or so, maybe a couple of questions. Um, and I'll be around for the rest of the uh, next two days uh, to meet and talk with any of you. Question, right here. Yeah, Jim Brackle. So my question is, if the numbers come out so dramatically, way you well, it's a 50% savings, why does that, why does everybody know that? I and mean, why is that sort of, it seems like improvement on that, that uh, level, people would be sending a skyrocket. Yeah. The question is, if you look at the case of the Extremadura project in Spain, 50% savings in the cost of deploying uh, Linux versus Windows in, in their uh, schools, why, is it, why isn't that everybody knows about it? I guess because more people need to learn Spanish. I don't know. Uh, I think we're at the very beginning of measuring the economic value of open source in these very large scale implementations. Uh, if you look on the server side of technology where Linux has traditionally been strong, whether it's in telco equipment uh, or in the financial services world, um, you know, the, the multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar market that's been created around that gives evidence to the fact that there are these superior price performance savings um, in that world. In the case of, of where you're seeing these dramatic savings, often they're in the desktop world where we're at the very beginning uh, of the deployment of Linux and open source, mainly because uh, Linux and open source has been behind in that field. You haven't seen the features or functionality in a Linux desktop that have really enabled these dramatic savings like you're seeing in these uh, rollouts in schools in Europe and Russia. Um, I believe that as the rapid development process of Linux continues, as every six months you see a new Linux desktop out there, you'll really see even more dramatic results. So we're just at the beginning of that. And as we rapidly iterate and rapidly release new features, new functionality, really move with where technology is going, you know, web-based applications, centralized management of IT infrastructure, that Linux will increasingly achieve superior price performance. We're just at the beginning of that, and that's why I think not a lot of people are aware of what they can achieve with Linux today. Other questions? Go ahead. You uh, In terms of defining what open source is, the OSI defines what open source is. You're talking about defining what an open standard is. That's a great question. Uh, how many here can define what an open standard is? One guy. Two guys, maybe. Uh, I tell you, this is an area where I think the open source community uh, and the standards community could use some work. There, I bet you if I asked both of these gentlemen to define open standards that they would have different definitions. 
Uh, there is a school of thought that open standards should be uh, royalty free. Uh, there's a, a definition of open standards that say that they should uh, be uh, reasonable and non-discriminatory in nature. In other words, that if there's IP in there and there's a royalty or a license, uh, royalty license uh, in conjunction with that standard, that as long as it's very low cost or reasonable and non-discriminatory to people, that that's okay. I don't believe we've come up with a good uh, uh, definition of what an open standard is. Uh, you know, I would posit that it should be royalty free. Uh, it should have multiple implementations uh, for that standard. So probably a good example of an open standard versus uh, what I would consider is not an open standard is illustrated in the ODF versus OOXML world, uh, where you really have ODF as a royalty free um, uh, standard with multiple implementations uh, available to it, multiple organizations being able to adhere to that standard, um, and in contrast you have the OOXML standard which Microsoft is pushing, uh, which makes it very difficult, in fact it's been impossible to date for any competitive products to actually comply with that standard, and it's unclear what IP is included in that standard which would uh, bear a royalty. So this is a good way to sort of look at creating definitions for what an open standard is, and I think that the ODF OOXML case is really in the leading edge of creating that definition. One more question. Hi, Jason Gabelmeyer. You had characterized in your slides that it is a bit of a two-horse race, Linux and Microsoft. I'm wondering what role you see for an operating system like Solaris. For, so the question was, we characterize the world as Linux and Windows, and then uh, how does Solaris uh, fit into that? I think Solaris uh, decreases in its market share, decreases in its technical significance over time at the cost of Linux and Windows. Almost all of the market data is really backing this up. You're really not seeing the kind of growth in Solaris or Open OpenSolaris uh, that you're seeing in Linux and Windows. Um, I, I think that Sun and Jonathan Schwartz are making very positive moves in trying to build a community around the open uh, Solaris platform, uh, open sourcing that code, trying to create a community, uh, but uh, they're really under the gun in creating the same kind of massive collaboration uh, that you're really seeing in the Linux world um, because they're sort of late to this game in opening up uh, that platform. So as a result, I really see the role of these proprietary Unix uh, systems existing over time, but really being reduced to uh, more niche uh, use cases uh, than the mainstream that we're going to see, which is Linux and Windows. This is obviously important for uh, government users of technology or IT decision makers to consider because when you choose a platform, you're really uh, entering into an implicit futures contract with that platform. You're going to need to support it for the next 5, 10, 15 years. If you make a wrong technology choice, if you choose a platform that's actually reducing in terms of the size of the market, the number of uh, people available to support that platform, the number of commercial vendors out there available to support that platform, uh, you can uh, post risk to your organization or to your government body uh, in doing so. So that's really the way we look at it. What do you see as the Linux Foundation's role in terms of applications themselves, not just the infrastructure? So the Linux Foundation, and you talk about Linux mostly, I think, at the infrastructure level, even the examples like the Japanese government replacing its operating systems with Linux. But the applications themselves still tend to be uh, proprietary applications that are migrating to a Linux platform. And what do you see the Linux Foundation's role in promoting applications in the open source world as well? Or do you see it mostly structured just at infrastructure promoting the general use of Linux? So the question is, is the Linux Foundation going to do anything about getting more applications on the Linux platform? Yeah, is I think so. I mean, you think, you know, that, that was historically, that was sort of the map. Microsoft yep. struggled and Microsoft took up took off because applications were available. How many people would like to see more applications on the Linux platform out there? And, and not just that, but are those applications going to also be open source? I mean you can you can get Oracle on Linux, but it's not an open source application. 
So the role for the foundation is to make it dead simple for application developers to port to an open platform like Linux. That is the, the, the goal of the organization. We have programs to support that. Um, in terms of whether those applications are open source or not, it's a mix. Um, but the key here is to make it dead simple for application developers to target Linux in a standardized way so that they can target the Linux platform. They don't have to do 50 ports to 50 different versions of Linux. I'll make it very, very cheap and easy to get new applications onto the platform. That is definitively a role uh, the foundation would like to play. Uh, and there's a few examples of work we're doing to support that cause. Uh, first, we've created what's called the Linux Developer Network. This is the Linux community's uh, response to what's an incredibly good development uh, set of development tools, the Microsoft Developer Network. Uh, what this is is a centralized place where developers can go to understand how to write standard applications, uh, to understand how to utilize the LSB, uh, to uh, communicate with their peers about how uh, their Porting to the platform and really get more applications, whether they're proprietary or open source, onto the Linux platform. It no. goes back to that first question, which is get 50% savings, so why aren't more people doing it? Because if you convert all your desktops to Linux and none of your applications, what does that mean? You have a That's exactly why they're not doing it. Um, so the, the, the question is, with all these great savings, why aren't more people switching? Because obviously Microsoft has an incumbent. Uh, advantage in the number of applications that are on those, those platforms. Generally, people pick operating systems for three reasons, right? The number of applications that are available on that platform, because that's what they really care about, is the applications that they're using, right? How do I run my procurement system, my, my banking system? Uh, they tend to pick platforms for performance reasons, right? It has superior performance. Linux does well in this area in terms of uh, power management, in terms of, uh, you know, supercomputing capability. Um, and, and then they uh, tend to pick platforms on just purely price alone, right? And Linux is obviously free and, and has a huge advantage there. Uh, unfortunately, in many developing countries, all software is free, so this uh, is, is no ad advantage. In fact, I advise governments overseas that piracy actually helps uh, Microsoft and uh, hurts open source uh, by increasing the uh, network effect advantage that uh, these uh, incumbent vendors have in the marketplace. So in tackling that first one, the foundation really wants to get more applications on the platform by doing it in a standardized way, providing tools, and really whether the open source applications, uh, in the case of open office, I believe that that will become a dominant um, application because the cost savings is so compelling. Um, but in other areas where it may be a very sophisticated supply chain management application, maybe those continue to be proprietary applications because the open development model is not as good to date at producing those type of applications.